Hello everyone, David Shapiro here with another video about Raven and Natural Language Cognitive Architecture, or NALCA. Um, I took a break for a couple months to write my book. The book is now out. You can find a link to it in the description below. The EPUB is free. Um, the paperback version is $7.95. I only make about $0.70 cents on it. Um, yeah, so here's where we're at. I have created a few versions of Raven now, and the most recent one is based on OpenAI's uh, GPT-3 engine, but I'm using the Curie engine, which is um, cheap and fast, but it's not that intelligent. So if you take a look at this real quick, you'll see that Raven is kind of, um, you know, there's, there's some good information, you know, I suggest you take the day off and relax, that's great. Um, and then I say, hey Raven, I want to uh, make a video about you. What do you think about that? And then uh, the output is kind of weird. <laughs> um, and then Raven gets stuck on that, which this is called what I call prompt contamination. Um, prompt contamination happens when uh, GPT-3 can't quite understand what the point of the prompt is and there's too much superfluous information. Um, so this basically means that I'm going to need to take a break until either DaVinci is faster and cheaper or GPT-4 comes out. Uh, so anyways, um, let's see. Hey Raven, what is the future of the world if we invent nuclear fusion? And I will show you all of the microservices that are running in the background in just a second. Um, yeah, see, it, it's confused. So this is this is pretty much expected when you're using Curie to try and run a full AGI. It's not quite there yet. If I were to switch to the DaVinci engine, it would be a little bit better. And in fact, um, DaVinci is the engine that I used for all the experimentation um, in, uh, the, in the book, um, all the research code. But I wanted to do a version in Curie because one, it's cheaper. It's so much cheaper and so much faster um, and so it can still give you a proof of concept. Okay, so you can see that Raven is thinking it's not completely coherent, and that's fine. Um, so let's take a quick tour of the actual files in this. So here is the repository. Um, this code is, is publicly available, um, or at least it will be as soon as I publish this video. Um, there are a few Python scripts. Um, and I'll show you each of these in turn. I'll probably um, take a deep dive into the code in a separate video. This is just going to be an overview. And then, uh, so there's there's a few of the microservices, and then um, and then a whole slew of prompts. I've got about two dozen prompts um, that I'm currently using to run Raven. Uh, and then I also record every single interaction with GPT-3. So you can see that Raven is thinking. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. It's not just an input, a prompt, output. Raven is actually thinking quite a bit. Um, but again, because I'm using Curie, uh, it, it you know there's only there's only going to be so much quality that I can get. I've kind of run into the boundaries of the technology today. Okay, so uh, let me go to actually. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, this is the actual diagram, the, the architecture of what it's doing here. Um, so at the, I'm using Discord as the primary interface. Discord has a great API. It is, it is a great platform for bots. Um, and then you can also integrate audio later if you need to. So this is the set of services that I've got running. So first is the Discord service. Um, Discord service handles all of the communication with the Discord API. It also um, compiles the contexts. So if you uh, read my book or check out um, check out other videos, there's the, there's what's called the context, which is the input for Nalco. So it, it creates and handles the context. It sends it to the outer loop service. Um, and all of these use the, the transformer service, which the transformer service uh, handles communication with GPT-3. Um, so uh, it sends the it sends the chat logs to the outer loop, uh, which then uses uh, communication with the shared database and the QA service to compose its corpus, um, and then also to generate the output. And again, all of these services make use of GPT-3, um, so that's why GPT-3 is in its own service, so that everyone can communicate with it separately. Um, this also allows you to scale up very easily. 
Um, let's see, then there's the QA service. QA is, is question answering, not quality assurance. Um, so QA is question answering. And in this version, I have two primary methods that I'm using QA. One is that I use QA to try and answer um, questions using episodic memories. Um, or I just use the transformer because GPT-3 has a lot of knowledge embedded. Um, so basically what I have this, this very naive QA service do, uh, what it does is it tries to answer questions uh, just by extracting information from, uh, from GPT-3. And if it says, I don't know, then it will try and query the database um, to look for answers as well. Again, this is all very naive. This is just a demonstration level. This is not an enterprise or commercial grade um, QA service. This will require a lot of work. But again, the purpose of this particular um, instance is to show the simplest possible example. Um, this is more for learning and communication and demonstration rather than actually something that's going to be taken into production. And then finally, at the very bottom is the inner loop service, which um, is actually generating most of these logs. So um, there's a tremendous amount of internal thought going on all the time um, where Raven is thinking about thinking about thought, basically, trying to extract themes um, of, of the episodic memories, uh, figure out what to do about it, and so on. And again, we'll get into a deeper dive into each of these functions in a later video. Um, right now, I wanted to focus on the overview, which is the architecture and how it works, and also just show that it is indeed working. Um, Raven is not sick. Why would you think that? Let's see what happens. I am not sick. Yes, correct. So anyways, you can see Raven is easily confused. Raven can't really keep up with stuff. Um, let me go ahead and cancel these services. Um, let's see. Let's see, this is the shared database service. Um, I have it using just SQLite. Um, SQLite is, uh, is kind of the bare minimum that you can, you can um, run this on. It's not the easiest thing to run it on, but it is easy. Um, or it's not the best, sorry. It's not the best thing to run it on, but it is easy and it's fast. Um, I have had much better results using Solar. And so the next version of, of Raven that I create will use Solar as a microservice instead of SQLite. Um, but as a relational database, this is going to be a little bit easier to understand. Let's see. Um, this is the transformer service. So this is actually handling all the communication with OpenAI. And you can see it running in real time. Um, Raven is clearly thinking a lot behind the scenes. And this actually gets rather expensive. Um, let me show you real quick how much, um, how many tokens this uses. So um, let's see, I'm at uh, 600,000 tokens um, just running this, this demonstration and doing a couple tests before recording this video um, today alone. And then that, fortunately, because I'm on Curie, it's, uh, it's only $3.6. DaVinci is 10 times as expensive, so this would be $36 just to run a couple of conversations. So I mentioned in my book that, that Nauka today would cost more than $1,000 a month to run. Um, you could easily get to several hundred dollars a day because of how much it's thinking. So that's why I needed to do a, a demonstration version on Curie, because otherwise it would just be prohibitively expensive to run. Um, so yeah, this is... This is very expensive to run. Let's see, this was the transformer service. Um, let's see, this was the database service. Um, the QA service, oh, looks like I've got a bug in the QA service. It, it faults every now and then. There's still some bugs I have to troubleshoot. Um, that's all right. Let's see, the outer loop. Okay, so you can see here's some information coming from the outer loop. Oh, yep, there is, a, there is a, another fault. Um, I've designed it in such a way that it's actually robust against faults because uh, you obviously don't want Raven to just spit out error codes. Um, and that actually leads me to another thought that I'll address later, which is basically that I believe AGI is going to need some kind of proprioception. So in the, in the future versions of Raven, Raven will actually be aware of these faults. Um, Raven will say, hey, my QA service is faulting. I need to restart that or I need to, I need to troubleshoot that. Um, that actually won't be as difficult as you might think. Let's see. And then we've got the Discord service. 
Um, so this is obviously not running because I'm not typing in any messages. And then finally the inner loop, which is one of the busiest services. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and kill all those. So we can stop burning, we can stop burning uh, tokens. And let's go, let's take a quick high, high level overview of these, of these uh, microservices. When I say microservices, I mean microservices. Each one is, is generally less than 100 lines of code or about 100 lines of code. Um, so basically I just have this as a continuous loop. Uh, this is the Discord service. So it, it, it talks to Discord and, um, and it looks for incoming messages. Right now, I've got just a few rules to determine whether or not Raven is gonna speak. Um, and before, I actually had a prompt to determine whether or not Raven was gonna speak. Let me show that to you real quick. Um, let's see, next speaker. Um, so basically what I, was gonna, what I was gonna use was actually use GPT-3 to determine, to, or to predict who the next speaker was. And this works on DaVinci, but Curie is not intelligent enough to handle this. Um, if you take the same exact prompt and switch between DaVinci and Curie, DaVinci performs very well on this um, in terms of figuring out who's gonna, who should talk next, um, but Curie can't figure it out. Um, so again, I'm kind of bumping up into technical limitations of the technology today. Um, so I switched from, from using GPT-3 to predict who's gonna talk to just some basic rules. Um, it's faster, quicker, and cheaper. Um, I guess faster and quicker mean the same thing. Anyways, so very, very bare bones um, uh, 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 microservice here. Um, then let's go to the outer loop. The outer loop is a little bit longer. Um, and you see I've got, I've got the, the exceptions commented out because I was doing some debugging. Um, but again, this is, this is really simple. Basically what it does is the primary thing is that it takes the context um, from, the, from the incoming, um, pardon me, it takes the context from the Discord service and then runs it through a whole bunch of prompts um, to generate the corpus. And then it also uses um, QA, right? It uses, uh, it, it uses QA to both generate questions and then also get the answers to those questions. So that's kind of Raven thinking behind the scenes. And that's, that's one of the reasons that you see so many, um, so many logs being used. So just running for a few minutes, it was probably running, let's see, I was testing uh, at about 10 a.m. and then a little bit more testing. And you see most of these were actually in the last few minutes as I've been recording this video. Um, so it generated more than 500 interactions with GPT-3 um, just to handle the, all the question answering um, and the inner monologue that Raven has. <clears throat> um, so once it does that, it will, it will compile everything into a corpus and then use the constitution and output prompts to generate that. And let me go ahead and show you what those look like because um, showing you what the actual end product is will make it make a little bit more sense. Um, let's see, there was a lot of thought going on so you gotta scroll up and find um, a constitution and output, there we go. So this, this is kind of the final product of the outer loop. Um, so here's the constitution, which is basically saying, okay, what do I think about this? Oh, see, that was not good. I needed to add a stop there, it didn't get that. Um, oh, this is because it faulted. Interesting, okay, so even though it was generating faults, um, it still figured out, it still got this far. Um, I think this was caused by the fault in the QA service. Um, anyways, so yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit embarrassing. That's okay. Uh, the ultimate result is still the same. Scroll down. Raven says, I am not sick. Um, yep. Okay. So by compiling these, I know this is, this does not, this is not a good look. Um, again, this is, this is a demonstration level version. Um, and it needs a lot of help. Um, I also need to, to revisit the QA system. Um, I had much better look, uh, luck on the QA system when it was based on solar. Um, so let me go ahead and advance to that, the QA service, whoops. Um, let's see, actually this video is getting a little bit long. Um, well, the QA service, I, I pretty much told you what it does already. Um, basically it tries to answer from memory um, or 
it tries to answer um, it tries to give a factual answer from GPT-3 um, and basically in order to answer from memory it will it will pull the database for for a list of keywords it'll generate a list of keywords and um, and then search the the database for relevant memories and then go through and try and answer based on that um, this actually works pretty well when it doesn't generate an error I'll have to go and investigate that some but again I showed you in real time um, that it was able to um, integrate information um, so that's a QA service. Again, less than 100 lines of code. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, and then the shared database. So the shared database can run on SQLite, it can run on Solar, it can run on Postgre, whatever you want to do, or Postgres. I don't know. I've heard people call it either. Um, but basically, this runs on SQLite, and it presents um, a REST API interface uh, that allows it to do uh, give it a few functions. One is you can just um, uh, select something. So this will, this will return a list um, of, of information. Um, I've got it, you know, where, where type is like one type, order by, and then limit. Um, so that will give you, this allows you to select lists of things. Um, and then increment. Uh, so, oh, increment is a critical function because as demonstrated in, or as I wrote about in the book, um, you need the ability to update memories. So every time you update a memory, or every time you access a memory, you need to update its last access time and its access count. Um, so that's where you see here, I increment the access count, and I also set the last access time. And basically, this allows Raven to keep track of how often memories are accessed. And there's a few reasons that you want to do that. I'll go into a deeper dive in, uh, in future videos again, because this one is getting to be a little bit long. Um, here's the transformer service. Uh, I think this is the last one. Or actually, no, I need to do the inner loop. Um, transformer service, it's super simple. All it does is handle uh, communication with OpenAI. Um, I've got a few defaults set. Um, in a future version, I'm going to make this a little bit more flexible um, so that it, we're not just reliant on Curie with some of these, some of these default settings. Um, Again, super simple microservice, but by making this a microservice, it allows you to switch to other transformers if you want to. Say you want to use a version of BERT or GPTJ or whatever else, you can you can you can replace your transformer microservice with any other transformer. Um, so let's say you want to switch from GPT-3 to GPT-2. You want to switch to GPT-4 when it comes out. You want to switch to another vendor. You can do that by having it all um, distributed in this manner. Um, again, super simple. This one's less than 60 lines of code. And then finally, the inner loop. The inner loop is, is actually the largest and, and most difficult um, uh, service because this is basically like Raven thinking, right? This is Raven thinking about thoughts. Um, it is very similar um, to the corpus in terms of how it is composed. However, um, I added this concept called chronology um, I found that it works better if you actually lay out thoughts in, in, in sequence. Um, and so the chronology basically just says, okay, here's all the relevant memories to this current memory. Let's lay them out in chronological sequence and then see if we can draw any conclusions from it. Um, the reason for that is because if Raven is thinking about a, an older thought, Raven might also have more recent memories um, in order to see like cause and effect. Um, so let's say, you know, you go to school um, or go to work, you know, a year ago, something happened, and then you get a follow-up event, um, and then you think about that, you lay it all out in sequence, and you say, oh, this is what happened, right? And this is all automatic in human brains, right? You, you automatically, your brain automatically gives you your, whenever you remember something, it kind of has a little bit of metadata attached to it. Um, you kind of remember how long ago something was. Was it yesterday? Was it a week ago? Was it a year ago? And of course, human memories um, are not are not that explicit. Like you might have trouble remembering was it four days ago or three days ago, um, but you remember relatively how recently something was. Okay, so this video is almost 20 minutes long. I'll go ahead and stop it here. This was just a, a broad overview plus a demonstration of Raven and Nauka or natural language architecture, cognitive architecture, I apologize. Um, thanks for watching and stay tuned for future videos. Have a good one.